So the army was very quick to move in here and set up some sort of infrastructure. This is where the tower was. This was the Russian field marshal's bunker. If you ever drive over the border between Germany and Poland, crossing the Oder River, you may come through the small town of Kustrin. And it is a very small town, there's not much to see, and there's a reason for that. It was destroyed completely several times over its history. Kustrin was initially settled by Slavic tribesmen in the 10th century. The Knights Templar claimed the settlement in the 13th century also, and they gave name to the city. In the mid-1500s, a castle and a fortress was constructed and order fortifications were gradually added over the centuries. One of them we visited already. The primary fortification was located in the old town as opposed to the new town, on the confluence of the Oda and Vada rivers. That put it in a very strategic important location, and it developed into a fortified castrally and the Polish taxation post as the waterway separated and today still does the border between Poland and Germany. After the Thirteen Year War broke out in 1454, the Knights sold the town to Brandenburg in order to raise funds for war against Poland. From 1535 to 1571, the town was made the capital of Neumark region and a castle was built. With this time, the castle was expanded into a fortress, one of the largest in the region while still Crown Prince Frederick the Great was imprisoned in the fortress. In 1758, the town was besieged by the Russians. The surrounding wooden buildings were destroyed, but the fortress held firm. Half a century later, the French were luckier, and the town was taken and held by Napoleon's forces from 1806 to 1814. However, when they retreated, they burnt down the entire town. The town recovered and became one of the most important railway hubs in the Kingdom of Prussia, and later for the German Empire. In 1857, the construction of the railroad lines were completed, and a new town grew up on the eastern side of the old. And the Prussians constructed several large artillery forts around the city, as we visited. Kustrin itself also acquired new artillery barracks, which were finished in 1903 on an island across from the railway station. That was followed by engineer barracks in 1913. However, by the time World War I ran around, the forts were completely obsolete and were used for prisoners of war. After World War I, some of the fortifications were demanded destroyed by the Treaty of Versailles. And this city is one story of constant destruction throughout its history. By the start of the Second World War, 24,000 people lived here, and there were 32 factories in and around the town. Also, the town held several prisoner of war camps and few labor camps. The people here lived in relatively peace and quiet until refugees began flooding through the city from the east. Also, during the war, it was bombed a few times by the Allies due to its strategic locations as the gate to Berlin through the Silo Heights. And finally, after the refugees, the Russians came. It was now to become the site of one of the bloodiest battles of the war, as deemed a fortress city by Hitler himself. And the Russians were at the gate of the winter 1944, with their first attack in January. One of the men in the siege of Kustrin, Captain Albrecht Wurzhagen, wrote after the battle that the Germans in town considered themselves already dead men. And this was on the heels of the biggest Soviet offensive, back ration, which literally destroyed Army Group Center, pushing them back through to the German border. There were little in the way of stopping the Russians marching straight to Berlin. Guderian told Hitler, the Eastern Front is like a house of cards, he said. If the front is broken through at one point, the rest will collapse. And for twelve and a half divisions, it's far too small to extend such a large front. At 0435 January 12, the Soviet artillery, amounting to 230 guns per kilometer, opened a devastating barrage on General Maximilian Reich Freiherr von Edelsheim's 48th Panzer Corps, which was trying to contain Soviet forces inside the Baranov Bridgehead in Poland. It was a Panzer Corps in name only, consisting of only three weak infantry battalions.
The 3rd Guards Army and the 4th Tanks Guards Army from Marshal Ivan Eskonyev's 1st Ukrainian Front surged forward. Von Edelheim's defenses were shattered. By noon, the three divisions no longer existed, and those that survived were fleeing for their lives. In Kustrin, people started to get nervous, and the feeling grew as the local Volkssturm battalions composed, mostly of teenage boys. Those men, who were either unfit or too old for military service, was mobilized on January 24th. There was now little doubt that something was going very wrong to the east. The Russians were reported less than 70 kilometers away, and there was only a scattering of engineers and artillery units in town. Some few infantry units consisted of trainees or men convalescing. During the final days of January, the garrison of Fortress Kustain began to grow as a variety of small units started arriving in town. Still few anti-tank weapons, but these were strengthened by the arrival of a few panther tanks, turrets, embedded in strong points along the lightly avenues of attack. There were Luftwaffe personnel from flak units, some no longer had flak pieces. Also an Einsatz battalion made up mostly Muslims, made up from troops from the Caucasus. There were Hitler Youth, Volkssturm, Hungarians, member of the Waffen-SS, men who had simply been separated from their units and stopped and pressed into service here. It seemed like an unlikely mix that would be able to stop the Russians. But General Reger, the later SS General Heinz Reinfahrt, they worked hard to turn this into a real fighting force. And here stood a ragtag group of thousands of different men with little equipment facing Zhuikov and Katukovs with the spear of the massive Russian army. Zhukov wanted them to reach the order quickly and establish bridgeheads on the western bank. But while the frantic build-up was happening in Kostrin, hard to dig through the frozen earth, Mother Nature helped a bit. A blizzard now hit Central Europe, January 27-28. to 28. Mounds of snow piled up everywhere, slowing Zhukov's mechanized and motorized forces to a crawl. He also had other problems, despite his mindless optimism, his rapid advance was becoming a logistical nightmare. His supply lines have grown between two to four hundred kilometers, from depots to furnish the front-line units with gasoline and ammunition. There was also the fact that the German forces facing his northern flank was putting up a lot more resistance than he had expected. The town's defenses had been divided up in two sectors, the old town, with the castle and the fortress, and the new town. And during the later days of January, the weather turned warmer, so now all the snow that had fallen began to melt, which made Sukov's life even harder. However, on the 31st, the forward elements of his front reached the order north of Kostrin. The flow of refugees that had streamed into the city suddenly stopped on the 31st. This was an ominous warning to the garrison, and early in the afternoon, a column of Soviet tanks came up through the villages of Drevich, just north of Kostrin. Here they first rolled over the group of panzer grenadiers that were supposed to defend the position, then they spread out. A group of about a dozen tanks, many of them American Lend Lease Shermans, made their way through the outskirts of Kostrin and into Neustadt, the new town. They kept on going towards the bridges, but were stopped by the influx of panicked civilians whose vehicles have created a traffic jam. This was fortunate because the garrison was not at all aware that the Russians were this close. German forces with Panzerfausts or sticky bombs rushed to the area, and in the end only four Russian tanks made it safely back to their lines. The rest were destroyed. But after Shukov's drive, the first pillar Russian front had lost 17,000 men killed and 60,000 sick or wounded, that's 7% of his total manpower. And he knew for the final assault on Berlin, he would need to be up to full strength. Stalin knew this as well, so he was told his forward drive was to halt and he could now consolidate his positions. And that meant he could devote a lot of attention to the fortress of Kustrin. The beginning of February, flak units had begun moving into the town. However, these were manned by 12, 13-year-old boys, Hitler Youth, much to the dismay of the hardened soldiers in the bridgehead. And now the probing attacks of the Soviets had begun. They initially thrust into the outskirts of town, taking a factory from Hungarian troops. This was retaken. Artillery was exchanged, as was probing attacks and counterattacks that failed. The Germans was offering a stiffer resistance in the north than the Russians had thought. However, they did have limited success when they managed to seal the supply route on the western bank of the Oder. 
Fortunately, the timely arrival of Colonel Helmut Solokov's depleted 21st Panzer Division managed to open up a thin corridor that once again gave Klostrain a lifeline to the west. By February 7th, both sides had now settled into a routine with the Soviets firing artillery into town around midday, constantly mounting nuisance attacks and the garrison working to shore up the defenses between the artillery barrages. Despite the Soviet harassment, the garrison had now created somewhat of a cohesive defense. In addition to the approximately 6,800 civilians still in town, there were approximately 9,100 members of the Wehrmacht and the Waffen-SS and 900 Volkssturm defending the fortress. At times, the strength was estimated to be around 16,000 due to the arrival and departure of various units. Also, an estimated 102 artillery pieces, 30 flak guns, 50 mortars, 25 self-propelled guns and 10 captured Katusha rocket launchers were also in the fortress at various times. Constant artillery bombardment made it hard to traverse the clogged streets and burning buildings. On February 19th, the civilians in Neustadt was notified that they were to be evacuated for the next few days. Between two and 3,000 people made their way across the order and headed west through the narrow supply corridor under the cover of darkness. Surprisingly, the Soviet artillery was relatively quiet, and the evacuations was carried out with few casualties. The fortress was now under tactical command of SS Lieutenant General Matthias Kleidenheist Kampf, SS Panzer Corps, who had received orders stressing the importance of holding the town and preventing the Russians from taking the bridges. At this time, during the Soviet continued artillery fire, the Hitler Youth boys, fighting for Kostrin, were ordered to evacuate. Some of them protested the order, but grudgingly they obeyed, much to the relief of the older garrison. Rain was now pelting the Kustrin sector in March, making life miserable for both sides. It also did mask the Soviet movements on the northern side of the fortress. The Russians were planning to attack the new town. Driving straight through the Varda bridges, four regiments, supported by heavy and medium tanks, would form the main assault although the tanks would have a difficult time in the muddy terrain, and indeed, many got stuck down. The assault was preceded by a massive artillery bombardment on March 6th. The Neustadt was soon shrouded in smoke and burning buildings, which made it helpful masking Russian movements. Wursthagen later recalled after the war, the explosions of the enemy shells were deafening. We had not yet experienced anything like this. We were stationed in the old city, and it seemed as if all of Neustadt was on fire. Expecting an imminent attack, the garrison Neustadt prepared itself to repel the enemy. However, the Soviets made a flanking attack on Kiez in a surprise attempt to take the suburb. After initial success, the Russians were stopped by desperate counterattack that retook some of the ground lost early that day but leaving most of the southeast section of town in enemy hands. This was a bloody battle. The attack on Neustadt continued the next day, supported by tanks and the Red Air Force. The attackers made steady progress. Proceeding through the Frederick Wilhelm Canal, almost at the bridges, German engineers were ordered to blow up the Vada bridges to prevent them from falling into Soviet hands. This they did, prematurely. This action also isolated the approximately 6,000 troops that were still holding out in Neustadt. Much of the blame was placed on the Colonel Walter, who had lost command and control of his troops. From now, close quarter fighting in Neustadt went on from March 9 to 12. The trapped German forces organized strong points, such as infantry barracks, that had to be blasted out by Soviet artillery and engineers. Because of the closeness of the attacking and defending forces, no artillery could really be efficient on either side. The final battles for Neustadt centered around the infantry barracks, and another strong point was Neuswerke, both of which on the northeast side of the sector. On March 12th, they were both taken. And Lieutenant General Betzine declared the area secure. The Russians reported taking 2,774 prisoners and claimed another 3,000 Germans killed. This now only left the new part of town, Neustadt. For the next nine days, constant fighting and attempts by the Russians to break in through the old town continued. However, now the Russians were going for a double envelopment. But before the pincers closed around the fighting German garrison, the Germans had claimed 116 Soviet tanks destroyed, and the outer pins of the encirclements closed on the afternoon of the 23rd, 
as the Russians now consolidated their new positions. On March 27th, the Germans lost one desperate counterattack to reopen the corridor to the city. It was ordered by General Theodor Busa, the commander of the 9th Army, had been ordered to break through to the Kushtin garrison. Busa had assembled a battle group with over 500 infantry, 50 hetzers, several heavy Tiger tanks. Over the next two days, the battle group lost two-thirds of its complement to no avail. They ran into minefields and heavy Russian resistance. Hitler wanted to court-martial Busa, but Guderian went to his defense and was subsequently sent on six weeks of leave. However, none of this helped the men in the beleaguered city. The walls were crumbling, the buildings were on fire, and they were huddled together in basements underground, under the rubble. They requested permission to try to break out. This was denied. However, facing little alternative, on March 29th, the breakout began. After breaching the first Soviet lines, the garrison forces found themselves fighting hard, hand to hand, all night. So they moved towards the lines of the 9th Army. Having crossed the order, they were joined by the Keats defenders. The situation was confused and the Germans ran into fire from their own side as well, since they had no idea that a breakout was occurring. However, helped by the element of surprise, and darkness, rain, showers, the Kustrin survivors started trickling into the 9th Army's lines as dawn broke. Later that day, the 9th Army headquarters reported that 32 officers, 956 NCOs and lower ranks had made it through. Other smaller groups continued to reach the German lines through the next few days. According to a Wehrmacht report, the attempt had cost 627 men killed, 2,359 wounded, and another 6,994 were listed as missing. And still to this day, they find bodies and parts of bodies in the entire area surrounding the Kostrin, from the fortresses and the fields. Of the 16,000 defenders, only 1,200 would live to fight another day. And walking through the abandoned streets that marks where the buildings were, that was once a living town full of people and civilians and life, one can have imagined how beautiful this was in its heyday, and you can only think of the sadness of the destruction of the complete annihilation of this beautiful little town and its fortress. There had in latter years been talk of rebuilding parts of the fortress, parts of the town, as it once was. But these plans are on hold because these things cost money. But they're doing a good job keeping the ruins intact. And as you search through these, you can only imagine how the makeshift command posts, underground hospitals, and the life under the constant shelling and bombardment would have been. I want to take you through and show you what is left today. Except rubble and remains of the town. The city walls, the bastions, some of them still look intact. But here you see, wow, just, just a village that is no more. You see the steps up to the buildings that are no longer here, the streets. See the foundations, the stones, the steps. So what finally happened here? This was the, the last, what, March? In the last year, 44, the English bomber came and uh, um, sent phosphor bombs here. And then the Russian comes and they fight here three months. And ev every house have... Um, Keller? A basement. A basement. Just now they find German weapons in the basement. Uh, all full. Really? This is the old church, yeah. I've There's I've also been. a basement you can go So this this civilians were just living here during the war. Yeah, 
thick church walls. So the basement is here. It's a little overgrown, but uh, I mean, you can imagine how civilians and soldiers alike would be hiding here during the bombing in the three months of fighting. Most of the civilians evacuated down the road towards Berlin, the one we drove up coming here. Opposite where the castle was. And I would imagine these stones were part of the church having been built partly by large solid stones. And of course, in every medieval city inside a fortress walls, there was a church and there was also a castle on its own. And it was a beautiful old medieval castle that was sitting here built by the Prussians. And this was the old castle in the center opposite the church. Everything was just destroyed. There's, there's nothing left. I mean, just walls and... and, and foundations and, and ruins. I mean, yes, I would imagine that the basements in this area would be really interesting. The German soldiers lived in the basements. Yeah, because civilians had already fled, right? Yeah. Or... Well, there's a hole. And a very large drop. Good, there's another way. But as you see the basement here. Yeah, this looks acceptable. Nothing like an old fighting basement. I see sunshine, sunlight down there. What's it means by the time I get here? I'll find a different way. Holy wow. This used to be a beautiful place. dog up there looking at me. Wow. And you know there's artifacts from all the soldiers hiding down here. In the basement with the battle raging above. And they moved in here. There's actually modifications for communication in here. There's the three tubes for communication cables that's modern, that's in, uh, in cement, that's built into the wall. The three tube communication. So the army was very quick to move in here and set up some sort of infrastructure. Well, that's a promising sign. Come take a look at this. It's it's okay for her. This is not really bad. Yeah. That's modern. That's modern for World War II. That's not an original fort. I mean, it could be World War One, but I don't see why they would be. Looking 
for World War II era infrastructure. I mean, it was in the basement of an old castle, so it makes sense as a metal tube instrument. Here's a, here's a metal tube encased in cement that is not from the original construction of the fort, so they moved as something as well. There's another one up here. So they moved some sort of infrastructure in here into the basements. What a three-month battle. Look at this, how this is just collapsing. You know, this stuff that I'm sitting under. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Wow. Just imagine sitting in here, chewing the battle. Things up in the roof or up in the ceiling here where they could have been connected. And there's the pipe. And yeah, you can see how cables here would have walked along the walls. I mean, you can see why sitting in a wonderful star fortress. You turn into a command center of sorts for whatever army group was here. And this had been, this used to be round. That has also been bricked into something that might have fit into a door. There might have been a door here, might have been a door there. I can see why this would have been a command center. Even, even if. I was going to say temporary, but not so temporary that they didn't have time to lay cables and infrastructure and other pipes. Maybe a bunker oven. One would wonder what the mood was if it was thought they could hold here, or everybody knew this was just the last stand before the next retreat. And under most of these buildings there are basements, where they're still finding weapons. There's a door, hinge, that would have been in there, there would have been a door here. actually water resistant tar on that slab hanging there. That's interesting. the British to bomb this may not have been in their favor, considering, considering how ruins are to fight in and out of. The Russians, of all people, should know this. That fighting out of ruins like Stalingrad just made it easier for the defender. interesting. This is 
really something. I wonder where the metal bars came from. Oh, history dog of the day. Hi, Paula, Papa. Yeah, I just wonder. So this would have they would actually put water resistant tar. They put some communication inside as well. So I mean, they they planned they planned to use this place. This orange. It is, yeah. Now you may think that the end of the war was the end of the war for this poor castle inside the fort, but the trauma does not end there, sadly. Now after the war, the town again became Polish, because of course the area was under practical control of the Soviet Union. And much secrecy now surrounds this area for some reason. Several local stories and rumors surrounded what happened to the castle next. Of course, it was in ruins after the war time shelling. But the main walls were still standing, but the area was off limits for the civilian population for a long time. Eventually, new civilians settled here because all the Germans had been removed from all of the new eastern territories, so none of the old ones were able to return. But for many years, this area was off limits. And given that it was full of unexploded munitions and dead soldiers, that sort of makes sense. However, there were some indications that regional conservatists wanted to preserve it as a monument, even in the 50s and 60s. However, there then seemed to have been issued an order, all the way up from the Minister of Defense, to blow up the remains. Various reasons were given for the demolition, none of them seemed very good, but in March 1968, the remains of the castle was blown up by local sapper units. This was in the basement of the castle I'm in now. I don't know why there's an iron rung ladder. This little sign of some cement plaster here. Wow. So this was the old basement. An amazing place. Except, of course, when it's being shelled. Wow! This really is something. This must have been an amazing castle. I'm not very deep underground. Here's another could have been entrance. I'm guessing they built up all these bricks just to clean the rubble. As I said, they're still trying to figure out who and how many and how dead there might be in here. It's quietly coming down. Although this looks like it would have been a shell impact that exploded and later took everything down with it. It doesn't look like natural corrosion. Coming down. Oh, 
was looking for anything like these two nails in the wall. Something that would give us an idea exactly how involved the German headquarters or command post here was. And this is what we see World War II very often. There's a lot of porcelain and I think this was German. World War II. It was late war. Uh, there's a there's a story behind the porcelain that one day I will actually tell you what is. Just so I know a place where there's a lot more of it. Where they were trying to do something very modern with the porcelain. Even in here it looks like the little chips. This yellow wall doesn't fit in with the rest of the well. Castles were continuously built, rebuilt, reconstructed, redesigned, so that's not unusual. I'm assuming they cleared the room before stacking up the bricks. I don't exactly know why I'm assuming that. I didn't really get an idea of what a beautiful building this was. And here's a lot more porcelain. And this is, again, this is World War II. And this is what I really enjoy when I go to places like this. I see these artifacts that are sitting here and people don't take them home. Ah, this room electrical. I'm just going to let you guys play. The what is this game? That's an egg. Hey. It's like a very large light extra. I like it when people find things and then leave them in place for the next guy. <clears throat> what this was. When the castle stood, I have honestly no idea. I cannot even begin to guess. But here is an intact exit entrance with these metal rungs. So here's a nice and clean entrance exit. Well, the other one actually looked like it was a bit easier to jump onto. Why is it that I always find the comfortable exit or entrance after I crawl through the first muddy hole I saw? My mother may once have accused me somewhat of having been slightly impatient. And mom probably wasn't wrong. Well, she wasn't, let's face it. But what a place for a last stand. But for months, no shower, shelling, fighting, back and forths, not a lot of fun. Not a lot of fun at all. Oh, look at this, here's a lot more bits and pieces. There's a very small hole there. What a pretty picture this is. As long as you weren't underneath here when the shell hit and took that pit down with it. Lots of metal pipes and pieces. will say here's a lot of artifacts there's a lot of artifacts wow
That was a little nicer to get up. Small remain of the castle I was just in. Being a central position in the village, it would have been the natural defensive point or gathering point for the officers. And there was a church over here that would have been the same. But the water resistant tar I find interesting. Might have been newer. Because this above here would have been the floor. So I don't know where it would have come from. And after the demolition, the castle, and the church here was properly blown up. The locals mostly took the bricks that was used for whatever purposes they had of rebuilding of their own. But on the plus side, if there is one, some of the stones being quite odd shapes, those taken from the castle and now destroyed, were used for some of the renovation of this city fort ramparts. There is a little museum organization here that is trying to display the history of what happened, and they're slowly, money dependent, trying to restore some of the outer walls, ramparts, of course the famous city gates here. So at least a little bit of the castle still lives on in history today. This is new to stop water deterioration, but it's very hard to make a guess like that since it's been in existence since World War One and beyond. And here's another of the beautiful floors. There's a few of these very old castles that's been built. Some found in Holland and built by Napoleon I that was still in use for World War II, which is an impressive display of strength and ability that a castle can be built and survive the escalation of modern wars for 700 years. This one is only two, three hundred years old, but it could not stand up to constant shelling and bombardment of modern artillery. Not much really can. But it is a sign that the strategic positions were chosen well and never changed over all of these years. on the old pillar here. I don't know what stood here, but I hope to find out. Lots of bullet holes. One thing I find striking about this pillar is that the bullet holes are pretty much only on one side. And I don't know why I have thoughts of post-war executions lining up the German soldiers here and shooting them against this one side. It's just a thought or a suspicion since there's no damage to the other three sides of this pillar. It really is the strangest thing to just walk down a street and all you see is the entrances to these buildings that used to be here. And you get this sense that there was houses. There was a life here, there was an existence, and now it's all gone. It, it, 
It's the most interesting ghost town I, I can say I've been to. There's not a whole lot of walls left, but because of the way the nature has grown, you get the feeling of where the buildings were, where people lived. And then the war came and changed all that. And we still don't know what remains are in the basements, in the sewers, and underneath some of these ruins. On one of the old buildings. It would probably have been some sort of a tunneling system underneath the castle walls. But there's a lot of these basements and they're not exactly in the best shape in the world anymore. Some of them are, are quite thick. And some of them are now. Well, this was the floor of the building above. See the wall remains up here. Was there a bridge there back then? But not that one, certainly. Guess the old one was blown up. So this is one of the bastions of the fort. Yes. Now in 1945, the Russians were pushing hard towards Berlin, and every desperate measure they could possibly muster was flown against, including from the Air Force. The famous German ace Ernst Trudel, in his tank-busting Stuka, special designed, was actually shot down, flying cover over here by the fort. He crash-landed his uh, damaged Stuka right on the other side of the fort here, but of course, as we know, he survived. Isn't this a raveline? This would be a raveline that had been shot up in the 20th century. Now, the city will never come back here, but they are restoring slowly the parts of the fort, and you can clearly see still impacts of the battle. And then the repaired part. Good for them, they're doing it.
one of the houses, one of the remains. This is really something. Here you still see the floor left, possibly the bathroom of this house. Still hasn't been taken by nature like so many others. So here you really get a sense of this was somebody's house. And then when they had to flee, it became a place for a soldier's last stand. For months, the German soldiers fought, lived in the basements, no shower, no relief, no, just living in the basements of these buildings, fighting on the ramparts, fighting in every house and every block as they were decimated. So the stories this house could tell would be quite extraordinary. And here, be the next room or possibly the next house it's impossible to say really this almost looks like it was a window there's one big stone there there's the next room the houses were built very close together. They still had to fit within the star fort. And surrounded to this place are some amazing Prussian built forts. One that's intact. I'm reminded of Bortage when I see this, although this would have been larger. But at Bortage, you can see the village, the cities how everything existed, but there weren't the basements because of the high water level. Now, of course, here is there an enormous amount of stories about the underground. Naturally, there is an underground. There's tunnels, galleries, shelters, powder magazines, newer technical tunnels. There's a few bunkers from the war and quite a lot of construction fortress related. But there are so many stories about especially a secret underground passage under the order and there's even stories of a secret underground airport from the time of the war. Official researchers have not seen any evidence of this. And they also, by the way, as they mentioned, do not expect to find the Amber Room either. There's still a lot of things here to explore and document. And of course, they have little and no funding or resources whatsoever. And the many private explorers who dig around and find things here, unfortunately keep what they find to themselves and is thus lost to history. This is the partially restored gate. Imagine the hinges and double doors that would have been on there. Now they did a great job restoring this place. But even here in the restoration, you can still see the shrapnel impact from the detonations. And some of this is restored, and you can see some of the bricks have been replaced. But there's a clear sign here by the old hinge. This has been restored. They've done a great job of using the original stones and materials. But this was as it was in 1945. Here's one of the original walls that still survived. Of the Bastion Koenig, the King's Bastion, here on the inside of the wall. Now, if this had been just a pure fortress, you would have seen on the other side there would have been another fighting position or a ditch, a rampart, something, but there's not because this was a fort, this was a star fort with walls to protect the village 
that used to be here. And you can still see some of the walls protruding. Nothing really is left standing inside. Here originally you would have seen the ramp up to the cannon position. There's one of the old powder magazines. So back in the day they would have horses pull up the cannons of the ramps into position. Series when they actually lay brick for the ramp for the cannons. That's one of the old powder magazines. Also been damaged and hit by shells. And the cannon would have been up there, I imagine. Yeah. there. This is just an amazing place. But there's there's a sentimentality. There, you get a little sentimental here. It's, it's very hard not to because this was a place where so many people fought and died. Now this side is the one that faced Germany during the battle. So that is probably why it is largely intact and not destroyed here on this side. It was facing away from the Russian advance coming from here as they desperately wanted to cross the Oder River, the final barrier leading into Germany. There's a fort five kilometers over here an old military barracks right there across the water dating from way before World War II but this was the last waterway the last natural obstacle except for the sea low heights that the Russians needed to cross again this is the side facing away from the Russian advance this was one of the massive overcovered powder magazines that had a roof once. Apparently something hard and heavy hit it and everything collapsed except for the arches and the entrance to the powder magazine. This would have been one of the walls, and then inside here was an arched. Here was a tunnel. This entire bit would probably have been a room from this arch. I imagine the cannons could have been stored in here. Pulled out by the horses up the ramp. Scenes. But when this was built, I don't think anybody was planning on sheltering for Russian heavy howitzers. Well, maybe the Russians, certainly, but not the munitions 45. So unless there was a staircase down here, there must have been a staircase here. This is just a short tunnel with a powder magazine. But if there was no staircase, then the floor was raised, and I sort of don't want to believe that it was. This must have been a beautiful place.
you see how big this arch would have been for this room. There's so much rubble here and parts from buildings, foundations, slabs, cornerstones. Eventually somebody started cleaning up in the rubble, burying the dead they could find. And just like out in Sea Low Heights and many, many of the other battlefields in Germany, a lot of the soldiers had been locked up. So the civilians, the women, the children, the elderly, were put out into the fields in the forest and retrieved the dead German soldiers and tossed them in a trench somewhere. That was the realities of the aftermath of the war. But you see a street like this, this this was a village street with buildings and villagers and little shops everything you'd have in a little fortress village like this and then for those months of 45 oh, late 44 45 those months of 45 just changed everything One could imagine the people who lived here before the war thinking about returning home. I don't know what I would want to do. If I'd want to clear up the brush and turn this into a museum village, or just leave it in peace as a quiet memorial to those who died. There's another basement. I think they will really be visited one day. But under most of these buildings are basements. Here's another. Has been collapsed. We can only wonder if somebody was in here when it collapsed. There's another. Imagine that besides the command center in the basements of these ruins would be all the wounded. Although this time I would imagine they could still be evacuated across the order at least at night. I would love to take part of the excavation of one of these buildings, I truly would. But there's a lot of places I would like to excavate. This just have, when you walk through this place, and it, it, it sort of takes you in, in a way, given what took place here, given the ferociousness of the battle here. Forts are built to fight and although a different time and different people, one cannot say that it didn't do that. This looks like this would have been a nice a nice building. A really beautiful house with nice foundation stones, stairs leading up fairly broad door here. I like that they put up the street signs. They put up street signs to indicate where they were. And I think that's a... It just makes it a little sadder, I guess. Um, I hate to put it that way, but it, it really is the reminder that, well, here used to be a street. Here used to be a house. Here used to be a town. Here used to be people and full of life. 
walking down the cobblestone street here. And again, you see, you see signs of there are cellars and basements under all of these houses. It's hard not to think if somebody are still here or still laying in the ruins. There's always been something fascinating about exploring battlefields, places of destruction and war, imagining the events and the people and the fighting. When we're walking through here, it is a little melancholy because one is literally walking on a giant cemetery. And perhaps this is the best state to keep this in as a constant reminder of what war truly is, an endless destruction of men, monuments, towns, cities, and life. In early February, Kostrin had initially been cut off to the north and south of the city by the Russian units crossing the Oda. But the weather had warmed and the ice melted, the rivers flowed strongly now, leaving the only bridges in the center of the Russian lines, those at Kostrin. But on February the 2nd, the Russian 8th Guards Army Vanguard had been able to move forward units over the Oda and took the tip of the spur facing the Silo Heights. And in March, after Altstadt on the eastern part of Kostrin had fallen, Neustadt and Gogast, the next town over on the western side of the Oder, were now surrounded, and the German counterattack to relieve the encircled garrison had failed. Shukov wanted to press on, fast and hard, but Stalin had ordered him to secure the line first, as he was fearing a German counterattack. By late March, Shukov had his bridgehead firmly secured, and soon after he had new bridges built and enforced, now Russian men and material poured over the order, preparing the build-up, as in return Bus's 9th Army did the same with what limited forces they could muster for the final battle for Berlin. As the Russians had seized the high ground facing the Silo Heights, the 8th Guards Army had set up their headquarters there and dug in with artillery on the rear slopes and a myriad of running trenches and observation posts preparing for the battle. The Germans had the Silo village evacuated for civilians except for men able to build defenses, and Volkssturm and Hitler Youth now also marched towards the front. Goebbels visited the trenches himself, and on March 3rd, Hitler too visited General Busse's headquarters on the front line. Only 200,000 Germans were available to dig in facing the Russians on the opposing Silo Heights. They were facing nearly a million Russians who had slowly been battling their way forward since February. It was, according to one of the German World War I veterans, the battle here was worse than that at Verdun. The ground and hills here were taken and lost 25 times over a month of fighting, sometimes from trenches just meters apart and the scars are still seen here in the landscapes, although many of the trenches and the fields have by now been covered up. Stalin finally gave Shukov the final go-ahead, but he did not rush. He spent time detailing to his commanders the plan, and during this time, 26 bridges over the order was built by the Russians, along with numerous rafts covered by a strong anti-aircraft to keep the Luftwaffe at bay as well. In only two weeks, the Russians brought 76,000 soldiers, 3,000 tanks and self-propelled guns, 4,628 guns and mortars, 1,530 rocket launchers, and all the fuel, foodstuffs, oils these needed to be supplied with over the river and into position. This facing against the Germans, only 200,000 men, a little over 500 tanks, and 2,600 guns of all various calibers. 
and still this was not an easy fight for the Russians as we now know. Of course, here by sea low heights, the church too was heavily bombed and shelled during the fighting, but it still stands and it's declared a national monument. Past it is the spur so heavily fought for. Digging here is not legal, as basically this is one large cemetery, thus it's a memorial area. But I wanted to visit Zhukov's forward observation posts from where he would watch as all of his artillery opened up on April 14th, in the first preliminary bombardment. This is also where the Russians would learn the lesson why using projectors to light up a battlefield is generally a bad idea, but that's for another time. The only hope I have walking through this battlefield is that the puppy dog doesn't go dig up a femur, because we would be here for quite a while and have to make some semi-embarrassing phone calls. And here in the woods you see the remains of the artillery positions facing the sea low heights. And the German general Heinrich said he knew that the Russians were going to start this with an artillery strike. So he emptied out the trenches in the plateau here, except for a few remaining troops. Pulled everybody up to the sea low heights, 10 kilometers away. And as the Russians had pounded the front lines, the opening trenches, the front trenches of the German lines, with very little casualties, when they finally moved out of the jumping off positions, they were met with the main body of the German army and the SS, several SS units, Falsum Jäger, was in the thick of the battle here for several months. It took them almost three months to move the few kilometers from uh, the order to Silo. This was not an easy roll through battle from the Russians at all. You see the parallel holes duck into the side of the hill here, all for emplacements, vehicles, tanks, supplies, munitions. There's no time to build bunkers on either side here. This was just a battle that had to happen. And up here, on the reverse side of the slope, was Sukhov's command post. Both sides had dug in on the opposing hill, out of direct line of fire. So from here, you'd have the observation post for the Russian army, where they just stand here and overlook the battle lines. Out here, the sea low heights in this direction. But this was an exposed position. You really are standing within sight of the enemy. You have the trench lines, the running trenches to the Russian command. And these trenches are still here. Of course, this was not a fighting trench. This was a communication trench back to the bunkers where the information would be analyzed by the Russian command from whoever was up in the observation post. And these are still here. Some of the German lines are still there, dug in on the other side. All fairly hastily prepared positions, because everybody was planning on moving either forwards or in the opposite direction. When the Russian troops here jumped off, the German artillery on the far side of the hill of the Silo Heights opened up on them. They were well enough supplied, 
but it cost the Russians 30,000 to casualties to not make it on that first assault. Now we're on the reverse slope facing away from the direct fire. But this, if anything, was a battlefield and it is still littered by the marks of this. And this was far more of a ferocious battle than most people have thought. The Germans had no intentions of just letting the Russians walk into Berlin. They had their best, most well-trained, battle-hardened troops. And the Russians had a million on their side wanting to end this war by celebrating in Berlin. And of course, we all know how that went for the civilians in Berlin. But that's a different story. And at the end of the running trench, this was the Russian field marshal's bunker. Well, it was bigger. There was more covering over it, but at least here, this much remains. held together like German trenches. The studies of war and battles and warfare, the walking of battlefields is one of the most important tasks I can yet undertake while I'm here. That maybe we can pass on the knowledge, the tragedies, the heroicisms, the deaths, the lives of those who fought the most cataclysmic event of mankind. Once the scars of the buildings and the people are gone, this is the only memory we have left of something we had deemed to not repeat. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebmus nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.